Hello, everyone, and welcome to Navigating Everyday Life During COVID-19. Um, it is a pleasure for those of you I have not spoken with. My name is Elizabeth Tadaldi, and I'm the new Associate Director of Development for Plan Giving, and I'm honored to be with all of you today. For those of you who are have attended our Legacy Society event in the past, we are so happy to have you with us again. And for those of you who are new to our Legacy Society event this year, we are so happy to have you with us and welcome. When it is safe to meet in large groups again, I look forward to meeting all of you in person. And just a quick note before we get started, if during the presentation you have any questions for Dr. Marin or Dr. Leipzig, there'll be a little Q&A function. If you look at the bottom right of your screen, you'll see a share screen option, a record option, and a Q&A all the way to the right. Feel free to type in your question in the Q&A option, and certainly we can address it during the presentation today. And as you saw in the invitation, this is an event that we have for our Legacy Society. So for those of you who are not familiar with our Legacy Society, I just wanted to take a moment and share a little bit more and our Legacy Society at Mount Sinai is an exclusive group that is comprised of those individuals who have created their legacy at Mount Sinai by leaving us or giving us a planned gift and including us in their estate plans. And at Mount Sinai, planned gifts are truly integral to our success because in making a planned gift, you are in essence supporting and funding the future of healthcare. And truly at Mount Sinai, that means that making sure we will always be on the forefront of healthcare excellence in perpetuity, which is something that you were all very passionate about in working at Mount Sinai and want to continue that for the future. And planned gifts can be made in many different ways. I know sometimes that can sound very broad to those who aren't familiar with planned giving, but that includes things like bequests, endowments and uh, trusts and any of those may have various tax benefits and especially that we are approaching very quickly the end of the year. Charitable gift annuities and or IRA rollovers may have certain tax benefits and at any point if you have questions or would like to further discuss any planned giving information at Mount Sinai, I hope that you will contact me. I would love to hear from you and further discuss, and I'd be happy to discuss it with your attorneys or tax planners. And being part of the Legacy Society, one of the many special advantages is our annual event, which this year is this luncheon, uh, not luncheon, excuse me, webinar, usually a luncheon that we are having virtually today. And every year we pick a fitting topic and truly I feel and know that this year's topic of navigating everyday life during COVID-19 will speak to all of us today on the call and we'll discuss techniques on how to use and uh, be resilient in the here and now. It is my pleasure to introduce our two speakers today of Dr. Roseanne Leipzig and Dr. Deborah Marin. And Dr. Roseanne Leipzig is our, the Gerald and May Ellen Ritter Professor, the Vice Chair of Education, Brookdale Department of Geriatrics and Palliative Medicine, all at the Icon School of Medicine at Mount Sinai. And she is an internationally recognized leader in geriatrics-based medicine and, and her research and publication um, highlight models for teaching geriatrics, chronic care and evidence-based medicine. And she has received numerous awards uh, from prestigious, prestigious, excuse me, organizations, including the American College of Physicians and the American Geriatric Society and services and advocacy for GLBT elders. And Dr. Deborah Marin is the George and Marianne Sokolik Blumenthal Professor of Psychiatry, the director of the Mount Sinai Center for Stress, Resilience and Personal Growth, the director Center for Spirituality and Health, and the director of the Ombuds Office, all at the Icon School of Medicine at Mount Sinai. And Dr. Marin specializes in geriatric psychiatry and Alzheimer's disease, a member of the Mount Sinai faculty since 1992. She has many, still evolving, many important position, uh, positions at Mount Sinai, not limited to, but including the Chief of Division of Geriatric Psychiatry and the Director of Geriatric Psychiatry Fellowship Program, 
and the medical director of the vice chair for education, Dr. Marin has also been very excitedly newly appointed as a director for our Center for Stress, Resilience and Personal Growth, which you will hear about more today. And doing all of this, she will still retain her role as the director for the Center for Spirituality and the health director for the Ombuds office within the school. We are so grateful to have both of our experts with us today. And I know you will enjoy their discussion. So without further ado, which getting through all their accomplishments certainly um, was a lot, but is well-deserved and we are so lucky to have them with us. I will pass it over to Dr. Leipzig and Dr. Marin. Thank you very much. Um, you. I'm very glad to be with you again. Um, and I'm, as I just mentioned, I'm sorry we're missing the dessert, but we'll have to deal with that next year. Um, I have known Dr. Marin since I came to Mount Sinai way too many years ago um, and have worked with her and am and delighted to be able to uh, be the moderator for this session. So, Debbie, this is an unprecedented time for all of us. And it sounds like the idea of a center for stress, resilience, and personal growth would be a wonderful thing to have at this point in time. So could you talk a little bit about what you know about the effect of this time on, on mental health for all of us, some of the findings on this, and then tell us a little about the center. And I echo my tremendous pleasure in working with Roseanne and, and the Department of Geriatrics over decades. So um, I think I'm sure those folks on the on this webinar know about the mental health consequences that have been written, you know, a lot. But I think I really need to highlight some very important things. Um, back in June, uh, the CDC published a report of over 5,000 individuals in the United States, and the findings were, quite frankly, uh, awe-inspiring and frightening in that almost 40% of the population experienced either anxiety, uh, depression, traumatic stress reactions, and increased suicidality, increase in substance abuse as well. And um, interestingly enough, older individuals actually are faring better than younger individuals. And I think that speaks to the concept that if one does get older, one has to be resilient anyway. Those findings were echoed in a, in a study done at Mount Sinai Hospital in April, where 40% of the workers experienced at least one of these symptoms or illnesses. So back in March, um, the center was actually conceived. And do you want me to go into that, Roseanne, now? Because sure. I think that gives the backdrop of the behavioral health issues. First of all, these findings really speak to the uh, contribution of several factors that lead to, it's not just COVID-19, it's the economic distress, it is the factors nature of what's going on in politics. So we can't just look at it in terms of an illness. This is a, a state of being that we have right now across the world. So back in March, it was quite clear that the workers were very distressed in all the hospital systems, you know, the death rates were exceptionally high, we were basically COVID hospitals. And um, the workers, uh, we felt that we had to do something. So multiple departments basically came together, band together to create a 24 seven hotline for individuals, uh, in, you know, basically all virtual services, groups, one-on-one -on -one sessions. Interestingly enough, the chaplains were heavily utilized by the staff. And then as that acute model ended, because people were just basically extending themselves, the decision was made in April to create this new center with the design to actually focus initially on all 42,000 plus workers across the Mount Sinai Health System hospitals in New York. And that's the goal of the center is not just to treat people, although we are doing that, but it's also to identify methods to mitigate some of the stress reactions people are having through enhancing resilience in real life models of doing that. And that's where we, that's where we are right now. We've developed multiple ways to do that, but that's the core value of our center. Okay. So can you tell us um, a little bit before we get into the, the parts of the center, the word resilience has um, been bandied about a lot <laughs> over the last year. And I just want to make sure that we're all talking about the same thing. So could you talk for a few minutes about what is it and what it feels like and some of the things we might want to be doing to make sure we have it. 
So the, the field of resilience research is only like three decades old. Most research in terms of how people do behaviorally have to do with illness. And then we realize, well, what a minute, we have to talk about wellness. So while there are multiple definitions by different folks, the core feature of resilience is the ability to bounce back in the face of adversity. It is a process. It's not an on or off switch. It can be enhanced. It can be challenged as well. So that basically is what resilience is. Ed, can I just interrupt for a second? Is resilience mainly a mental health construct or is it also a physical health construct? Well, the mind-body connection is so remarkably firm. For example, did you know that they're basically straight pathways from our gut cells to our brain cells? So the connectivity between brain and soul and mind and body is just, you cannot separate them. It's a construct of behaviors and beliefs, which also are promoted by attending to one's physical self. And I would guess that the COVID um, pandemic and the world in which we're living in right now has put a stress on resilience as well. So could you speak to us a little bit about how we build resilience? Sure. You well, actually, one thing I want to just digress is the concept of post-traumatic growth. Because it turns out that some challenges in life are actually necessary for us to become resilient. And when people weather this remarkably challenging time, a lot of us can look back and go, wow, I made it. I'm navigating it. So there can be some growth. Some people equate it to a tree being reshaped by the, by the wind, reconstructs itself, but it keeps on growing out again. So resilience uh, is actually can be enhanced just by experiencing something, assuming it's not so overwhelmingly traumatic that a person really is traumatized. So the question is how to enhance resilience. I think we should maybe review the, the factors of resilience, which by the way, the uh, people in the audience are very clever because <laughs> they kind of set me up to talk about the factors of resilience. There are basically 10 factors of resilience, but they can be actually combined into five big buckets. One is social connectivity. We are social beings. The isolation of the pandemic, both physical and ecologically are very bad things for us. So the more we stay connected, the happier our brains and souls are. Another one is facing fears. To be Pollyanna and go, I'm gonna muscle through it. It's, you're not doing yourself a favor. It's actually a good thing to say that one is fearful. The trick then is to see what can one control? How can one control that fear? Because some fear is just an idea. So to be able to reframe the fear and go, I'm anxious, but you know what? I can do this. I can go to the store. You know, I can't really exercise. It's okay. And by the way, one can be very resilient and very fearful. Okay. Another one is being... We are cautiously optimistic, again, weathering the storm, if you will. Another one actually is self-care is a big bucket. What I mean is take care of yourself, not just physically, eat right, exercise, and the ways to mitigate some of the difficulties we have with I could talk about more later. And the last one actually is meaning making, turning to spirituality or one's faith. It turns out that having, it could be yoga, it can be your religion, it can be nature. Finding a higher a construct than one is, is a very grounding experience for people. It also is a way that people could congregate over things. So those are kind of the condensed versions, you know, the core features. I cannot stress enough social connectivity. Ask for help too. A lot of folks I bet in this audience are giving a lot of help <laughs> to their children, whoever. Asking for help is a good thing. Okay. So can you give us some ideas of activities we can do at home, which is where we tend to be spending a lot of our time right now, to so, be able to bolster these things? One thing I do recommend is uh, having a, a retrievable schedule in one's mind that's reproducible and predictable from day to day. That's an example of taking control of something that you can take control of. So for employees at Mount Sinai who work virtual, I go, 
if you bike before the water cooler at noon, make a Zoom meeting <laughs> at noon. You know, do something that can recreate your schedule. Gyms may be closed, but you can walk up and down the stairs. You can go out for a walk. You can walk around the apartment. Anything that reintroduces some semblance of what you did before. It's important to get dressed like one used to. It's important to reach out. Those are, I think, are key mitig mitigating things that really can help uh, in this time of uncertainty. You mentioned that there's this new center. So can you tell us a little bit about what the center does and who it's for? So this center um, actually is an evolution from a tremendous amount of research and work that's been done actually at Mount Sinai in depression, anxiety, and post-traumatic stress. For those who don't know, Mount Sinai is one of the most funded World Trade Center programs for first responders. It's internationally renowned, it's published a lot of material on stress reactions, and they are funded through 2090. So it's, yeah. So given all the brain power that was here, basically our heads were put together and said, let's take the model we know and let's see what we can do. So the first thing that we did actually was to build an app, by the way, in four weeks with the Hazel Plattner Digital Health Institute. Think about that. And the purpose of the app is for individuals to very confidentially find out how they're doing. They fill out these forms, validated instruments on wellness and stress reactions. And as soon as they fill out the form, they get a response, how they're doing. It's green, meaning doing well. It's yellow, maybe not so well. And if they're not doing so well, there's suggestions made. What you could tips of the day, what you can do. You, uh, people could contact our center through the app, you can call us and sign up for our resilience workshops. And the workshops are the five workshops I talked about. It's not clinical care. These are workshops in which employees can congregate virtually right now, usually employees of similar disciplines, to discuss the topic of resilience and then actually develop a resilience plan, something that's measurable, actionable, and meaningful. Everybody has their own plan. So that's the app. Then we have um, a lot of education. We're going around, you know, the systems talking about, you know, that it, to try to uh, destigmatize the stress reactions people have. We have a very strong community engagement program. The center is for everybody. And that's a very big statement I'm saying. We have what's called an accelerator. It's a community engagement model of folks from all over the health system tell us what they think. By the way, this is started in June. They told us Apple, uh, iOS isn't good enough. I do for Android. So we, app was developed for Android. They said, you better have Spanish speaking workshops. Workshops were translated into Spanish. They told us you really got to get out there walking on the ground. Flyers are being disseminated everywhere. We also have, and we have coaching from social workers who are trained. The other arm was exceptionally unusual. It was very clear from Drs. Davis and Shawnee that they really wanted Mount Sinai Health System to be able to really lower the bar for employees to get help. And getting, seeking care, first of all, for healthcare providers is hard to do, particularly for one's stress level, many different reasons. We've created a highly confidential space where employees actually, um, We've worked with a lot of insurance companies that to get rid of deductibles, to try to get rid of all the associated costs in very private areas that are not by a clinic, we will can go for help. We just started that four weeks ago because psychiatry was getting so many calls from the community that we had to do something for our employees. Okay, so now we're all at kind of a funny place because there's this feeling is it coming back? Is it not coming back? And I know here at Sinai, we so far, and I knock wood, <laughs> this is, have been, you know, we have some a number of people with COVID, but it's not anywhere near where we were. Mm -hmm. And it's staying um, steady. But for people who have been through this before, even the thought of this coming back is very scary. So both from an employee and from somebody in the community's point of view, what can we do to kind of help keep these fears down? Well, one thing, you know, I am a psychiatrist by training and Roseanne, by the way, is an expert on some of the stuff I'm talking about. Anyway, she could, she could answer questions as well as I can, is to really try to remember that the fear is a fear. 
that if you really look at the incidence or the development of COVID at this time, if what, because we know so much more about the illness, right? I mean, one reason workers were so devastated was they didn't know what to do. Person on the back, person on the belly. Do we give hydroxychloroquine? Who should get on a ventilator? Will we be enough masks? Those things now are much more controllable. So while I do have friends who are my age and older who worry, we have to remember it's a thought. It's actually not being matched by the reality of what we know and what progress we've made in treating this condition. That's one thing. The other issues of anxiety clearly were around the election and I'm, I'm being apolitical, or we can probably guess how we feel as physicians. You know, that anxiety, I think, while there's continued anxiety there too, we do live in a democracy, things are being done the one thing I do recommend is to not watch CNN or Fox or MSNBC all the time. I liken it to watching the towers fall, quite frankly. And I was there that night. So I can tell you it was a really stressful experience. So try not to over-engage. That fear, that is an engendering fear. And when you talk with your friends or family, I call them sometimes resilient circles, if you will, when you're in a circle, if you start ruminating about their fears when you there is some control that actually triggers a stress response in us it actually changes our perception it amplifies our anxiety so while talking about things that are fearful or scary is fine but to ruminate on them is not a good plan you're not helping yourself any suggestions for how to not ruminate on it <laughs> Well, you know, I mentioned one thing about don't don't stay glued to the TV or, or Twitter or whatever. Uh, the best thing is to recognize that we are in a fearful situation. And if you start going down what I call it, go into the loop, I call it this kind of loop that goes on in our brain, you want to interrupt the circuitry, if you will. You want to short it a little bit. And the way to do that is actually to stop and do something you know either gives you meaning, some activity, right? Uh, Think about what is meaning making for you, reaching out maybe to family, seeing how the kids are, grandkids are, siblings, friends across the country. Again, that social connectivity can help break that loop by redirecting your energy, if you will, to something else that is more pleasant. Okay. We received a question before this from um, one of the potential audience members who was asking about ways to address interruptions to sleep patterns, mm -hmm. which many of us have experienced during this COVID period. Right. I know one answer is to not watch Rachel Maddow before I'm trying to go to sleep. <laughs> um. uh, so that is where actually exercise and breaking up your day and compartmentalize it to morning, afternoon, evening is critical. I mean, I know myself, I was in the hospital a lot of the time here, so it was Roseanne, but you know, the days just merge the Zoom meetings went on. It was like, when is it night? Oh my God, it's nine o'clock at night. The sun went down. So, you know, part of it is breaking up your day. Uh, and part of the problem with, with what happens is that people become very sedentary. And yours truly included. And I believe me, I like to, I like to get my walking in. So it's very important to uh, continue your exercise regimen um, as much as possible. Uh, get, getting sun is very important for your day, night, you know, if you hold yourself up, it's, it's a very bad thing. And of course, the typical sleep hygiene things, which Roseanne knows very well, which is, you know, I know people are drinking more alcohol, but sales are up. But I really say that is, um, if somebody's so anxious and depressed that they have to do that, I would say, speak to your doctor. It's, it's not a bad thing to drink alcohol in terms of bad person. It is a bad thing for sleep, though. It's really a bad thing for sleep. Or and, and that blue light from TV. Right. So it, what Debbie's talking about there is the fact that many people who can't sleep in the middle of the night get up and start using their computer or their iPad, and there is a blue light that comes out of that. That's just going to keep you awake longer. Right. So it's not what you want to be doing at that point in time. A lot of times the anxiety, you know, that uh, Roseanne and I were talking about, there are some very good apps, by the way, that can help yes. with re reframing. And they're, they're based upon the cognitive techniques I was just discussing. I mean, I'm just there's calm, there's shut eye, but they're really good studies to show. And for those people who may have mood disorders, sometimes light is good, you know, getting bright light machine as well to entrain yourself. And if your sleep's disrupted, if you really work on this, you, you get a leg up. So the, what I'm hearing is at the center at this point is 
primarily for employees of Mount Sinai. Not that there aren't enough of them that will need it. Um, will it ever be open to people from the community or are there pieces of this that might be available to those of us who are not employees? Actually, um, excellent question. Uh, this center was developed in a time of crisis, but you know, this, th the expertise that we have, we have so many smart people at Sinai. You know, I'm, I have so many friends who've been helping with the center. Um, no, we do want to make an outward facing center. You know, we envision it being a, a trauma center, if you will, because trauma comes in many different flavors, correct? And to actually be outward facing, you know, we view the app that we're developing. I we just talked about screening, but we're going to the digital health sphere right now. You know, that, uh, you know, that, that people can actually use an app to actually work on some of these things, journal things. So that, that is our goal for sure. But short term right now, in the next few months, we're really, we have to make sure we got this down correctly okay. with the folks who work here. Um, we can be open to questions from the audience if they wish to, uh, if you wish to um, put something in uh, on the bottom of the screen where it says Q&A. You can just type things in. Um, meanwhile, let me ask you something, and we can go back and forth on this. Uh, people, are, a lot of people are still very nervous about going out and doing things. Um, and right now, we're in this funny place where some places, some states are pulling back. Some states are keeping things as they are. I believe New York is going to be going back. Uh, a little bit come uh, today or tomorrow. Yeah, um, tomorrow, yeah. Hmm? tomorrow, yeah. Tomorrow, yeah. Um, so I know we're not going to know the answer, not a definitive answer, but are there, you know, things that we can do to be in a good mental health space with going outside, with um, going to the grocery store, things that, you know, we need to do and things that are good for us? Well, you know, I'm not an infectious disease expert, but I do know that the transmission of this illness can be definitely mitigated by people wearing face masks, the right kind of face mask, you know, wearing a scarf won't, won't do it. You really have to get a good face mask. There's some that are reusable with the, with the uh, you know, as you can have, you can put the screen in, whatever, right? Um, that's extremely important, wearing them correctly. Uh, we live in New York, people tend to be, uh, tend to abide by that rule, first of all. Now, the other thing is we also know that social distancing or physical distancing, I hate the word social distancing, is a good thing. But, you know, you can go in a supermarket. You know, it's okay to be near people and walk away. I mean, my understanding is it's 15 minutes close to somebody, less than six feet. You know, where I live in a city, it's, it's, it's desert. There's nobody there because I live with a lot of hotels. There, so it's very easy to social distance. But, you know, pick a time to shop that works for you. But, I, it, again, we talk about the fear. If you look at what the CDC says, they're, they're, they're correct when your Department of Health says, you know, it's easy for us to, let me give you an example. When I first came to the hospital in March, I was very scared. I washed my hands every every sanitizer that I would go up to that thing, wash my hands, even if you want a patient room. Right. So you can carry Purell with you, mm -hmm. right? Right. Wash down the stuff when you get home. But again, it, it, it's your fear over consuming you when, we, when they're actually losing some good public health experts information on this. Yeah. And I think what you said about washing your hands, although to the extreme is one thing, but after you go to the grocery store, after you've been out, you know, that's an extremely effective way to get rid of the virus. So we have a couple of questions. The first is, should I be afraid to go to the dentist? And can I take that one? Please. <laughs> All right. I think the dentists and their organizations are more on top of this than anybody I know of. Yeah. They have incredible national guidelines for how to be with someone. My wife is actually going to the dentist this afternoon. Um, I think if you need to go to the dentist, you should go to the dentist. No question about that. Then should I be afraid to be in an elevator where someone's mask is not covering their nose. You want me to? You want to I can take it, you can take it. I think we both can take it. The answer is don't go in the elevator. I mean, it's just not smart. Get, wait, wait for the next one. Yeah. They're being irresponsible. You're not gonna change their behavior. You know, so I just wait. I think that's um, a good answer for this. There's so much we really don't know 
and so much that changes day to day. You know, now that we have much better understanding of the virus and its transmission, um, many more people are staying at home with the virus. The people that we're seeing in the hospital are much sicker than they were, okay, um, but we're able to care for them better. So each, um, each day is a bit different. I agree. I do think there's more, more predictability. One reason why the healthcare workers at Mount Sinai and across the globe were very affected was frequently people were not only reassigned to new floors or hospitals, they were what's called redeployed. Yes. We had individuals like physician assistants, they often do surgical work. They had to learn how to run vents in ICUs. So you, you, you disrupted their social connectivity and then you ask them to do something they're not trained to do because we had to do that. I mean, there were a thousand COVID patients at Mount Sinai Hospital, that's where my home base is. You know, so there is unpredictability, but it's less so now, I would say. We know a lot more. Roseanne, but you know this better than I do. Yeah, no, you're absolutely right. Um, and, you know, the, the things that we also know is that indoors is much worse than outdoors. So if you're near someone, you know, or somebody you love, uh, God forbid, has COVID, that's the time to really, really be careful. Okay. We have another question here. Would the light recommended to treat SAD help relieve anxiety? That's yours. Well, you know, that's a good question. I, I would answer it with the following. Can you explain um, what SAD is? Sure. Seasonal affective disorder. So affective disorder is another term basically for a mood disorder. So we've known now for several decades, and we know from people in Scandinavia that when the sun goes down, the days get shorter, we may get a little blue, but some people, not a small percentage of folks who get depressed really get worse in the winter and they get better in the summer. Sometimes they become too late in the summer. So we're, we're beings, we're circadian beings. You've heard of, you know, um, you know, melatonin and stuff. So, the idea of light therapy, and now it's a very sophisticated way to get really cute lights if you want, with buzzers and wells, whatever. It's been shown that actually that can really help people, even they're not depressed, like major depression, you know, really not function, that they do, they, they, their, 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 their minds, their brains like the light exposure. So in terms of anxiety disorder and light therapy, I'm most familiar with light therapy for depression. I will say, though, that depression and, and light therapy is good for sleep. So anxiety, sleep, um, and also anxiety and depression are bedfellows. So, you know, that, that would be my, my, my thought. And it, it definitely can work. I think it's a good thing. Okay, great. Um, during this crisis, doctors started to do more video conferencing visits with patients. Do you think, I've got to move this up because it's, I've got it low on my screen. Uh, do you think this will affect the doctor-patient relationships if this continues even after the virus is under control? So I'll take this one, okay. Um, I think it has opened our options in a way that we didn't have before. And so for my patients whose uh, median age is 85, a lot of times it's easier to have the conversation on the screen than it is for them to be able to get into the office. That being said, I think the, the relationship depends on how the two people are working together. I don't think it's the screen alone that's in between. Um, obviously, if you need to examine a patient, it depends on what you need to examine, <laughs> okay? Um, and there are certain conversations I find that I need to have the person with me. It's just not an appropriate conversation to do by uh, screen that afterwards that person may be alone thinking this through. And I would prefer that they be in our practice and have a chance to think through what we've talked about. So um, I think it is gonna continue in certain ways. A lot of that's gonna have to do with payment structures because they didn't pay for any of this before. Um, for some simple, problems. I think it's, you know, no question. I would ask Deb to talk about for counseling because we see Michael 
Spitz, was that his name, from the, uh, from the Olympics in 72, has a talk app that he's, he's talking to people about all the time. So how about doing therapy this way? So telepsychiatry actually is a great vehicle. It actually, uh, in the following way, you see, I, um, I have patients, as Roseanne does, in the median age is about 85. And except for the folks who, who have difficulty managing the app, or the, you know, Zoom, or then, then I think they have to come in unless their family can help them. That's one downside. But from my perspective, telepsychiatry actually lowers the threshold. Being in person is great, but when I do therapy with people, if they come to my office, I have to wear an eye shield and a, a, ma a mask over my face, and the patient has to wear a mask. It's easier to read somebody, actually, if I can see their face. So while in person is great, I gotta tell you, for telepsychiatry is actually gonna level the playing field for access to care for psychiatrists. There are not many of us to go around. Quite frankly, Roseanne and her colleagues do the vast majority of psychiatric care. But from my perspective, it's an opportunity in some ways. Thank you. So holidays are coming up and I just got a, a uh, message this morning from one of my patients saying, what do I do? It's Thanksgiving. You know, my kids want to come in. Um, I'm not sure if I should have them in the house with me. Should I get them tested? Um, it's going to be really hard to go through the holidays without family. Suggestions for how people can do this? Well, you know, Zen, I think you can feel the infectious disease perspective, but I think sure. for individuals, particularly traveling is a little scary. You know, I would say create an environment as much as possible. I would say actually overdo it. I would say dress up. You know, um, I'm, I'm, we're going to have a holiday party with the chaplains in the system. So we're going to get them gift cards. And we can go and buy the food that they want. And we're going to have a holiday party with music in the background. So I, I, I wouldn't I zoom. give up. Hmm? I Zoom. I Zoom. I, I wouldn't give up on it. I think you may need to uh, change things a little bit. But don't, don't give up the holiday. It's not a good idea. So being creative is really something that we all are going to need to do. Well, I decorate, you can yeah. talk about the decorations behind you. I do think getting dressed up is a big deal. I'm not kidding you. Take, take the dress out of the closet, <laughs> you know, put on the heels. Uh, I, I mean, very serious. And you can, you can plan a menu, you know, together, even though you may be eating in a different place, you could still be in the same food. Right, right. And, you know, everybody has their own level of risk that they are willing to assume. And that I find is, um, is really important to recognize. And you have to figure out for yourself, what is your level of risk for getting the virus and for getting really sick with the virus? Because there are a lot of people who do get the virus, who get sick, but they get better, okay? So um, I know a lot of people who are you know, having COVID tests done before somebody comes to the house. You know, it's, there's just no way to know how accurate that's going to be. The accuracy of these tests has not been overly impressive, um, especially the ones you get drive through or at the local, um, uh, what do you call them? <laughs> Virgin <Yeah. Paris. laughs> you know. Um, so it really depends on how, um, how much risk you're willing to take on that way. I think the other thing to remember is a vaccine is coming mm -hmm. and this too shall pass. Right. I, I think it's really important to say that if this year is disrupted, all things being equal, you'll have Thanksgiving next year. You right. will have the barn bottom this one. <laughs> you know, I'm, just, I'm, bring, I'm bringing it up on purpose because I think we have to remember that. Right, absolutely. So do we have any other questions from the audience? Okay. I think Debbie's really given us some things to think about with being resilient um, and recognizing that resiliency really has an effect on your physical health as well as your mental health. Yeah. Okay. I, I do want to say one thing about tasks when you want to tackle, let's say, uh, being more active. Pick something that's doable, right? If you haven't been on the treadmill in the gym, for nine months, 
right? Speaking from my own words, you're not going to be on it for 30 minutes at 4.0. So pick something, anything you do that helps is a start. I had a patient who was absolutely terrified to go outside and walk, but her love in life was walking and hiking. Um, and so we just, we worked out a schedule where she, the first day, went out for five minutes. She found a buddy who wanted to walk as well. They walked on opposite sides of the street, okay? But they were with each other. And now she's out for a half hour almost every day with her walker, as a matter of fact. You, using a buddy's brilliant. Yeah. I mean, I've seen, I have friends with grandparents where they walk six feet apart, but they want to be six feet from the carriage. <laughs> right. <laughs> Okay. Well, I want to thank everybody for tuning in. Um, the flow uh, code is going to come back on the screen. But before you log off, I have one final important point to leave you with. And that's that all the innovative ways we just discussed of helping people face the mental health crisis of the COVID pandemic, and also many of the things that we didn't discuss that Mount Sinai is doing, to face the, to deal with the physical aspects of this, uh, medical aspects of this pandemic, they were made possible because of the extraordinary outpouring of philanthropy we received during these horrible months of the surge. But the work really has only just begun. We need your help to keep innovating and bring these innovations to a world in need. So this flow code that's on the screen, you can just point your smartphone camera at it and it takes you to a web page where you can support this important and urgent work. Thank you all for participating and stay safe. Thanks, Roseanne. Thanks everybody.